could uh, put the flag on the screen and we will uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. So everybody join me, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you. We appear to have a quorum. Thank you all for being here today. Let's go to item number two and a report from Chief Hollingsworth. Chief, how are you? Good afternoon, I'm doing well. Um, I'll give you a real quick synopsis from what's going on at the county and then down to our level. And then if you have any questions, I'm happy to address those as necessary. Um, obviously, you're, you are all aware that we continue under both a, a national, uh, state, and then county declarations of emergency secondary to the COVID-19 virus. Uh, currently in San Luis Obispo, there are 95 confirmed cases. There's three people in ICU, and then unfortunately over the weekend, we did have our first fatality in this county. Uh, what's really telling, though, is the number that not everybody is talking about is that there are of those 95, 65 are fully recovered and at home at this point. So uh, I really praise the, the medical people in the field that they're working and really helping this. The vast majority of these are uh, under self-quarantine at home. Um, from the Emergency Operations Center uh, component, there's a number of things that they're working on to help people in the county as necessary. Uh, there is a safe parking refuge set up at three different locations at this point, uh, Los Osos, Oceano, and then they just opened a third one at the San Luis Vets Hall. These are for people that are homeless but living out of their cars. So these are, these are uh, areas that are patrolled and um, at, we're actually offering um, uh, a law enforcement with uh, the probation department to keep that area safe. They're checking in in the evening and then leaving in the morning. There are hotels being, that have been set up for the homeless population. There's a number of places in the county, uh, right now primarily in San Luis, at Prado, and then also at Echo in, in uh, Tascadero, where they're ha and they have set up alternate sites for people that are uh, in the homeless, that, are, that uh, do not have a place to stay, um, and that they're coordinating uh, being able to set those up. Um, ironically, a number of people are not taking advantage of that. So, a uh, number of the hotels that they've set up, nobody is checking in. So there is a certain component of the, that population that just doesn't want uh, to participate in that that's being offered. Uh, probably the most significant thing at the county level is the alternate care facility, which they are aggressively working on. Uh, this is a, basically an external hospital that's being set up at Cal Poly University. The start date on this is anticipated for the 8th of April. There's gonna be just under 100 beds available and all of these beds are gonna be committed to treating uh, COVID positive patients. So, and that is the entire goal of that is to get them out of the other hospitals so they can continue dealing with the regular emergencies that are going on. Obviously for that to happen, there is an enormous amount of volunteer work that the public health department is uh, uh, recruiting for. Uh, they're in the process of vetting and screening over 200 uh, people that are retired doctors, nurses, psychologists, you name it, they're trying to get them online to be able to help. <clears throat> it's not going to immediately be able to uh, house a thousand beds. They're hoping around 160, but uh, they will be able to hit and they're expecting that potential surge, which is why they're building out to that extent. The shelter at home order has been extended at least until April 17th, and then it will be revisited by uh, County Public Health Department. And at this point, based on the, cur the uh, curve, the epidemic curve that they keep talking about and how much uh, impact this is gonna have to the community, people should already be uh, expecting that to be extended. The social distancing and sheltering at home is working. It's, it's significantly flattening that curve but the spread is still happening. So if you're gonna to have to go out, make sure it's for important uh, essential services only. And they have released new guidelines about being out where you should now at this point be wearing masks at all times. I realize that is contrary to the initial directives they put out, but this is an update to that. It is a little odd. I was the only person in Vons that I, there the other day wearing a mask and I felt a little bit alien, but I think it's the appropriate thing to do to help um, stem the spread of this. At the local level, 
<clears throat> our fire department is fully staffed, still responding to incidents. The call volume is going down. It has been going down throughout the entire county. People are not calling 911 as much, which is kind of an interesting side note, but the calls we are getting are significant. The public health department is not releasing numbers for uh, specifically addresses where um, I'm getting a lot of feedback all the time. Um, County is not really losing locations for where these are. However, the county chiefs have been able to get that information by signature and uh, allow that to get put into our dispatch center. So if my personnel get responded to an address, they'll be able to be notified over the air that there is some kind of issue with that. Um, and then lastly, what we're doing now to assist the community is that um, we are really pursuing what's called an Are You Okay program in Cambria. And that's going to be an inter a website interface that is going to be going to our 24-7 NTPE site. And that's going to allow and be staffed by CERT personnel as volunteers to be able to get information for the people in the community and be able to give them everything from just a, a, a daily check-in call to make sure that they're okay. Uh, to being able to direct them to the right kind of resource they may need, whether or not that's food or prescription delivery or pickup that's available through our EOC, or a lot of the food delivery stuff and volunteer uh, organizations that are located here in the community. It's just going to be a basically a holding center and be able to take all that information and then help like, direct uh, people out. We're hoping to have a beta part of that done later this week, and as soon as that's available, I'll push that out to, out to all of you so you can have a look at it. And other than that, I'm over to you for any questions. Uh, you said that uh, the shelter and home date was extended and what was that to? It was extended earlier this month to the right now, the next time it's gonna be reviewed is right before April 17th. Okay. And I cannot tell you one way or another, but based on the epidemic curve and what they're looking at, I think we should all be anticipating that being extended. And you were just talking about the, the daily check-in calls uh, being available. Yes, sir. Uh, how, how, would go, how would people go about um, uh, get, getting that service? So uh, one of the interesting side effects of this is that with Cabria being a retirement community, that, that uh, interaction component of people with each other is missing it now. So there's some people are able to take advantage of that with uh, phone calls or even these type of meetings through Zoom or go to meeting and still being able to talk to others. But we're setting up a, a interface through our emergency website that we developed this last year, 247ncep.org, com, or uh, gov. We, we, we bought all of the extensions to that. And there's going to be an application part on there where Harry, just as an example, if you were interested, you could log your name and phone number and it would go to the intake person that's monitoring that. And it's going to be a staff by CERT personnel. And they would then reach out to you and find out what it is you need, whether or not you just need a, a daily call to make sure you're okay, or if there's some kind of other service you're lacking. And at that point, they'll be able to direct you to the right resource. As soon as that's ready, I'll push that out so everybody can see it. Cool, yeah, that would be very helpful. And when it is fully ready to be implemented, we'll, we'll try to tap into every available social media resource and get that information out to the community at large so they'll all know that it exists. All right, thank you, Chief. Uh, anything else? No. Um, anybody have any questions for uh, Chief Hollingsworth? Well, doesn't appear that way. So thank you so much, Chief. All right, let's go on to um, item number three and the manager updates and uh, General Manager Hollingsworth. I think that was Weigold. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. It was, uh, yes. I'm sorry about that, John. Go right ahead. No, no, no problem. Uh, well, thank you, President Farmer. Um, and first I want to point out uh, that uh, throughout this whole time, the uh, thanks thanks to the board members for their flexibility on uh, discussions because uh, we really are operating uh, twenty four seven, and we're not even you know the highest active um, organization out there. 
such as the emergency responders or the healthcare. So I appreciate the directors taking my calls at all hours, day and night, literally, uh, weekends through throughout. Um, and it's been really super helpful. Um, you know, one example would be, uh, you know, trying to think through the restroom issue. Uh, and uh, um, President Farmer and I had, I don't know how many, how many calls back and forth. Uh, same with um, Director Steidel. And, um, but, but ha Harry was the one that, uh, you know, helped me work through that. And as a result, we, we have porta potties now at uh, all our other locations. And I'll, I'll let um, Carlos talk a little bit more about, you know, the whys and the hows on that. But, uh, but the bottom line is that the board has been fantastic. I appreciate all your availabilities for uh, all these issues. Um, so uh, my number one priority right now um, is really the health and safety of not only the staff, but also the board and the community as a whole. So um, you'll hear from the different managers here in a few minutes, talk about the things that we're doing to ensure safety first and foremost. Uh, we're able to do our mission and, and I'll talk about that as well. But really, if we don't have the people to do things, you know, really we're missing the point in my mind. So, um, so we've done an awful lot to ensure the safety and, and health of, of, uh, of everyone. And you'll see that borne out by the way we're, we've, we've uh, adjusted. Um, COVID-19 is here in the community. Uh, and so it's even more important now to follow all the directions that we have from higher authorities such as the CDC and the county. Um, I'd refer everyone to um, the county's website, which they set up specially for monitoring this both before, during, and after uh, you, you potentially get the virus. Uh, and that website's www.readyslow.org. Again, it's www.readyslow.org. They have the most information uh, up to date, uh, including all changes to laws, both at the national, uh, state, and county levels. And we're all using that. Uh, for our first uh, uh, data points. Um, so what, what can you or we all do uh, as, re as it relates to this virus? Well, first and foremost, wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. Number two, stay six feet away from others. Practice the social distancing we've all been hearing about. And then number three, stay home if you have symptoms and immediately contact your physician or your immediate supervisor if you're a staff member, because, and the symptoms may include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Um, you'll hear uh, that as many as uh, some news reports are up to 50% are asymptomatic, meaning there are no symptoms at all. Uh, that's kind of scary, but again, if you maintain the social distancing, that's what's in place to uh, to mitigate that. So what's constant right now with CCSD? Well, first of all, we continue our core CCSD mission of providing water, wastewater, emergency response facilities and administrative services. We are currently all healthy and no one is sick at the CCSD staff. We will continue to pay everyone. Uh, we have some new policies that are going into effect as it relates, as it as a result of state and national laws that have changed so that, uh, for example, uh, there are 80 extra 80 hours, two weeks of, of uh, sick pay uh, for staff members, just as one example. What are we doing for contingency planning? Well, we're doing a number of things here. Uh, we're working with the Slow County Health Department on a very regular basis. I was on the phone with them yesterday to, to verify some of the new information that was coming out and how it applies to, uh, to our operations. Uh, and we're also involved, depending on the department, at, at manager level through a number of other offices that they'll explain uh, in their reports. Uh, but we're all 
here working through the crisis, working not only among ourselves, but with other organizations at the local uh, and state levels. Uh, we're continuing to refine our continuity of operations plan. So when I arrived at the district, uh, one of the things I wanted to do, as many know, is to refine our emergency plans. How do we, and then what do we do if we're in an emergency? So we do have a continuity of operations plan. We're refining that on the fly uh, to better prepare ourselves to handle this crisis uh, should our team members become sick. Uh, we're working with FEMA already through the county, the Slow County team, uh, and they're helping us with our needs and expenses. The CCSD board uh, has previously declared a state of emergency, and that's enabled us to access the state and national government assistance programs and enables me with expanded authorities and spending limits should I need them. How are we adapting and improvising? Well, we're doing a number of things in this area as well. We're implementing, as I mentioned before, a revised sick pay program to cover all our employees if they have to be out of work as a result of the virus. This includes timeout uh, if they are, if they're sick, their family sick, they have to be put in quarantine, or they have to care for dependents. Uh, we're constantly avoiding contact with the public. As you can see on our website, we've instituted a number of um, uh, changes to the way we do business. Uh, and so uh, those include not only operating, but also cleaning procedures and the use of uh, personal protective equipment uh, uh, in, in some occasions. Um, we've suspended some group meetings. Actually, we've suspended all our group meetings, but they're all remote and we're conducting board committee and staff meetings remotely using Zoom video conferencing, teleconferencing, uh, as well as as one on one uh, telephone. Um, uh, that's the uh, summary from me. And uh, unless there are, are any questions, I'll turn it over to each of the respective managers uh, for each of them to to discuss, you know, their areas uh, in our operations in more detail. President Varmer, I have a question. Director Rice? Hello? Yes, go right yes. ahead. Thank you. Um, actually, t two specific questions. Um, uh, one is um, on the sick pay. I, I, you know, you realize you probably don't have the answer right now, but um, the additional sick pay, is that going to be added on to what people may have already had in their sick pay? Is it helping us pay for some of those sick days or they just don't count against the sick days they already have banked. I just don't, I, I don't know what that, um, that federal change might mean for our budgeting and for the contracted, you know, the SEIU and, and, and the fire department, what kind of, what that changes on the on the staffing, you know, on the, on the employee level. And like I said, you may not have the answer to that right now, but I'm interested to know how how that might help our budget situation. And the other one is is um, you spoke about expanded authorities based on our um, based on the declaration of emergency. And I just I was just curious if there was an example that you that you've used that additional authority because I don't know that there's been anything. Fortunately, this isn't something that impacts water supply. For the most part, from what I've heard, it's not a, it's not, it, this isn't, a, this isn't an emergency in our water and wastewater department, except for the staff that might get sick. Correct? It's not like a, you know, our, our wells went bad. That's correct. Yeah, those are my uh, so for the first question, yes, the 80 hours is an addition uh, and would be used first and foremost for uh, any sick time off uh, due to the coronavirus. Uh, and the second question, expanded authorities. No, I haven't utilized the expanded authority yet for any issue. Okay, that's that's great. I appreciate I appreciate you letting us know when if and when you do. 
hopefully you won't need to. Um, do you know if we will be getting reimbursed for those extra sick, paid sick hours or, or not? I don't know. Yeah, I think we're very early, early stages on FEMA reimbursements right now. I'll, I'll let the finance manager talk a little bit more about that because one, she's been through this before uh, during um, uh, her, her time, I think, with, uh, with, a, with storm damage. Um, we, we are only on, uh, on early stages, but there are, there are ways to uh, recover our costs that are related to um, our response to the virus. But, um, but I, I don't know that we have all the information yet on what's going to be covered and what's not because the county doesn't know. Um, but okay, again, and I'm, I'm comfortable. Yeah, I'm comfortable with I don't know yet because we don't know yet. That's totally fine. I got no problem with that. I just wanted to raise the question. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I see Director Howell, did you wish to ask a question? Make a comment? Haley, could you unmute Director Howell, please? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry. Uh, yeah, just a couple. I, I had a question regarding the FEMA and expenses, but I think I'll wait for Ms. Duffield on that one. Uh, and uh, also regarding uh, additional government assistance programs that uh, Director uh, uh, Weigold, or General Manager Weigold uh, mentioned. I wouldn't mind hearing a little more about that, but that can wait. The one thing I would like to ask is, uh, could, uh, could you explain to me why porta potties are a better solution than having the restrooms be open? I, I, I'm not, I'd just like to know, because I'm not seeing that that, I'm just wondering, could you explain that one to me, please? Sure. So, so the variables on the, on the, on the restrooms is one, it's a, uh, it's a safety issue for our folks to clean them. Um, and the, this, the sort of the risk uh, equation is uh, people more interaction with the public than we need. Um, and I was always, um, I've been looking for ways to minimize uh, exposure of, of all people. Uh, staff as well as the community. So that's one area. Two, um, we, we, um, we're, we're minimizing those activities where we can to, to, um, to minimize exposure in general. So some activities we're just no longer doing. Um, and so that was one of, the, one of the areas that we really wrestled through um, whether or not to keep them open, because technically people aren't supposed to be out. So theoretically, no one's using the porta pot, using the restrooms anyway. Um, and so, uh, but I recognize there are other issues such as the homeless. And, and uh, uh, President Farmer and I have talked about that, a lot about that. Um, and so I looked at what the other communities were doing. And uh, down the street from me in Morro Bay, they closed uh, almost all their restrooms kept uh, limited ones open um, and then put porta potties outside those that they didn't, uh, that they did close. And uh, so uh, in the case of the porta potties, that, that's, that's, uh, that's not staff uh, maintaining those. So uh, we pay for them, but, but don't have to maintain them. Does that answer your question? Kind of, uh, sorry, if I may. Uh, so, it sounds like the main issue really uh, against uh, forgetting for a moment that we don't wish to encourage people to be out and about. Uh, it sounds like the main issue is the cleaning of the restroom. So it sounds to me like from what you're saying is they still have to, you know, the porta potties have to be cleaned. It's just that we don't have to do it. Is that now that being the case, I mean, there is a, it was sort of a, a rather interesting ethical question, uh, which I just want to throw out. I mean, why is it better that, uh, that the, uh, Porta potty people should be at risk, and our people should not. I mean, I can see there's a. If you were on the other side of that, you might have a different uh, opinion. So, I, I, but I, I just wanted to get clear. So basically, it has to do with not exposing our people any more than need be. Uh, that uh, where they would be out cleaning the restrooms themselves. Uh, 
however, do I understand correctly then, it is an additional expense to the district, however, that we are, where we're having to have those porta potties. So I see you nodding. So thank you, That's, that clarifies that it. That is correct, and, and uh, that'll, that'll likely be uh, largely reimbursed for FEMA. Again, I, I don't wanna make any promises on that because all that information's not yet identified, uh, but we're tracking uh, all expenses, whether they're uh, costs such as rentals uh, or manpower. If there's a manpower expense to do something, we, um, my understanding is we may be able to be reimbursed for that uh, manpower cost. Yeah, I, I also want to mention one thing. I see uh, Vice President Seidel has her hand up. I just want to make a comment. Um, the porta potties are, um, there are also hand washing stations there as well. So that will provide for you know additional cleanliness. So I just wanted to um, to uh, mention that. Yes, uh, Vice President Steidel. Uh, thank you, President Farmer. I I just want to address a, an an element of the porta potties also. Um, I, I I do appreciate that it is additional protection for our staff, but it's the recognition also that our staff and the way that sometimes they have to interact with the community and potentially with other staff members, although keeping distance can place an additional risk at people who have to maintain the services here that um, um, are absolutely necessary. Um, if, if, if a business owner chooses to make those services available, I have to assume that that business owner is um, aware of circumstances and takes their own actions to make sure and protect their staff. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, I just wanna mention one thing and I, I, I uh, meant to make this remark uh, during Chief Hollingsworth's presentation, but I just wanna mention that uh, I heard this morning on the radio that over a quarter of a million people in this country have recovered from the coronavirus. And most of those had minimal symptoms. So obviously this is a serious emergency that is impacting uh, the entire way that we live uh, in this country right now, economically and socially. But the large portion of people that are contracting the virus are recovering. And that's something to keep in mind to maybe lower our anxiety levels. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, so General Manager Weigold, I believe um, that's probably the end of your presentation. So I will just uh, move on to uh, our finance manager and Ms. Duffield and good afternoon, Pam, how are you? Hello, President Farmer, members of the board. I'm good, is everybody well? Hope everybody's well. So I just want to recap quickly what um, we're continuing to do in the administrative office. So we do still have staff working remotely when possible. As you know, with our operation in finance, it's difficult at times to do that because we have uh, checks to process, you know, different banking transactions to process. And we also have um, confidential customer information and confidential employee information. So it becomes difficult at times to do certain parts of our job uh, remotely. So we're trying to do the best we can. When staff is in the office, we are taking um, extra precautions of continuum, like heightening our hygiene regimen. So Multiple times of the day, you'll see any one of us walking through the office with um, the, the disinfectant wipes, cleaning everything down that we think any of us could have touched. Um, we're also providing gloves and um, face masks if staff chooses to use those during the times of um, opening any mail or if they have to go out to the bank or to the post office. Um, we're providing those items for um, for staff. We're continuing to get a lot of uh, calls from residents um, regarding uh, payment plans and options they have in regards to delaying 
payment on their uh, account or if we're offering any kind of waivers of late fees. So we're continuing to set customers up on payment plans. Currently we have uh, 42 payment plans and that equates to about $50,000 in deferred revenue that we will be seeing. Um, we have posted information on our website and also on the front door of the administrative office in regards to um, options for alternative cash payments. So as you may recall, our payment due date is a week from today. Well, this is the time in our billing cycle where we do get a lot of cash payments. So we're trying to do a lot of outreach as customers call or um, they walk up to our window, go onto our website. We're trying to get the information out that we will not be able to accept cash during this time. Just so that you know the magnitude of the people that come through our office on the payment due date, sometimes we could get 100 people in our office. So, you know, in the current situation, we just can't accommodate you know, that kind of traffic coming in our office. Um, and then regards to FEMA, there was some discussion a little while ago about FEMA. So um, I have been through several FEMA events in my career in finance. So I'm very familiar with the FEMA process. And as soon as there's a declaration, you need to start tracking your costs. So I have begun to do that. Uh, there's very preliminary information right now that the county is gathering. They're just trying to determine if they will meet the threshold for our, our county. So kind of how FEMA works is that the County of San Luis Obispo is the leading agency and will submit information to FEMA. They reach out to all the cities and the CSDs within the county's boundaries and we have to feed information to the county. So what is happening right now is the county has reached out to those agencies and they're asking, do you have costs or do you foresee that you have costs? So we're trying to give them the best estimate that we could possibly have at this time again, not knowing what is going to be eligible for reimbursement and what is not going to be eligible. It's kind of uncharted territory to have a pandemic event. Usually FEMA comes to the aid when there's more of a property type of damage like a storm or you know, a tornado or an earthquake or you know, things like that. So this whole pandemic event is a little uncharted in their rules and regulations and how we claim and what forms we use and all that. So all that information is still evolving and I am working with um, County Public Works and County OES who I've worked with in the past and we will just keep in constant communication to determine what the next steps are. So that's about all I have to report. I would be happy to answer any questions. Um, I don't see any questions from any of the board members. Uh, anyone out there? I don't see uh, President Farmer. Yes, yes, uh, Director Rice. I can't see uh, your, uh, I just want to mention you're unable to raise a hand, so I don't know. So Right. Uh, I, so, I have no internet connection, and so okay. I'm calling in by phone. Sure, I, I see that. So it's no problem with uh, you know interrupting to not interrupting, but you okay. know just voicing yourself so I can acknowledge you. So go right ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the good report, Pam. I appreciate it. I appreciate the hard work you're doing. I hope you're able to maybe switch off who's in the office so you don't have to do too much uh, waltzing around each other. But I guess it is what it is. Um, so I'm going to ask two questions you probably don't know the answers to, or General Manager Weigel probably can't answer right now, but that seems to be the nature of questions at this moment in the world. So um, the first one is, um, are we including um, potential bad debt? Like we have to assume that there's going to be some folks that may not be able to pay their water bill and may eventually have to leave town. 
So that would be potentially or getting reimbursed for water and sewer bills since they've they've demanded we don't do shutoffs and and we will eventually need to be made whole by people that probably are living paycheck to paycheck and paying a bunch of back water bills may not even be possible. So that's the first one. And the second one is, um, is there any possible chance that we could um, maybe even toward the later end of the week give folks a call who, who haven't paid their bills yet to make sure they know? I just don't know the process of the billing or what you have easy access to or, the, or even staff time that would take to do, but just trying to head off a giant crowd on the 13th, right? Thank you. Sure. So, so as far as the bad debt goes, of course, with all these events that are occurring and the SB 998 rulings, um, making the delinquent water bill period extended, our, our debt is going to increase. You know, our outstanding bad debt will definitely increase. To what that magnitude is, it's hard to predict that because SB 998 went into effect on February 1st. And about the time that we were due for shutoffs was about the time that this whole shelter at home and coronavirus um, event kind of occurred. So it's a little difficult to predict, but you know, over the next few months, we'll be able to analyze the data and be able to answer your question. As far as reaching out to the community, we've been very vocal in letting people know on our website, plastered on our front door, also verbally as people are calling our front office, when our payment deadline is, and we're trying to work with customers to do that. We just had a customer call this morning and they want to pay us half now and half at the end of the month. That's totally feasible and we'll work with the customer to do such. So those are the kind of calls we're getting on a daily basis and we're working, you know, case by case with customers to make it so that it's not so stressful for them during this time. Director Rice, does that answer your questions and concerns? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Duffield, do you have uh, anything further uh, that you wish to uh, remark on? Um, no, that concludes my, my part. Okay, well, I don't see any other uh, further hand raising from uh, the members of the board. Uh, so uh, we'll move on to um, the facilities and resources update. And Carlos, how are you doing, buddy? Good afternoon, uh, President Farmer and board. I'm doing fine, thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to give you uh, an update on what's going on in the facilities and resources department. Uh, we've been extremely busy uh, with a lot of activity out on the uh, on our parks and, and facilities. Uh, as many people have probably seen, um, a lot of uh, parks, recreation areas, trails, open spaces have been flocked with people across the county, across the state. And a lot of our colleagues across across the county have um, had a difficult um, have had some difficulty in trying to keep the public uh, safe out there, and so they've had no choice but to uh, close down some of these parks and trails. I even uh, spoke to uh, the Pismo Preserve uh, representatives about it, and asked them what their uh, challenges were and reason behind closing the uh, Pismo Preserve. And uh, they had an a influx of thousands of people flocked to the Pismo Beach and they just had no way to be able to keep the public safe there. So they had to close that area as well. Uh, we ended up having the same issue on the ranch. Uh, we had a lot of people flock into the ranch, both local and tourists coming. Uh, not just down on the bluff trail, but actually throughout the ranch on grasslands, trails, on forest trails, and uh, also on the East Ranch as well. Uh, so understanding the, that the Fiscalini Ranch Preserve is an important 
uh, aspect to the community uh, for both mental and physical uh, well-being. The last thing we wanted to do was to close down the Fiscalini Ranch. So I reached out to the Fiscalini uh, board, their board, of, uh, their executive director. Uh, we talked and uh, tried to figure out a way that we could keep the ranch open. And we came up with several options that we wanted to implement. Uh, I asked them to take the lead in engagement with the public uh, through social media. And they did an excellent job reaching out to the public. In fact, uh, the executive director reached out to me and said that through March 5th, from March, March 5th through April 1st, they had a 288% increase in engagement on social media uh, about the activities on the ranch. So one of the first things we wanted to tackle was, and I'll share a few uh, pictures about what uh, we were doing out of, on the ranch. So the first uh, thing that we wanted to do was to address the bluff trail issue that we had out there. As the bluff trail is only uh, five feet in, in width, it doesn't provide adequate uh, distancing uh, for the public. And so we wanted to create a, a loop system out there. And we provided this uh, uh, trail loop from the bluff trail uh, going from the bluff and across the top on Marine Terrace Trail and providing several options for people to, to walk if they didn't wanna do the, the full walk. Uh, from there, we ended up uh, installing clear, large directional signs on the trailheads and on every intersection to make sure that the public knew what we wanted them to do. From there, we moved on to the grassland trails uh, and we ended up uh, increasing the width of these trails that are typically two to three uh, feet in width. And we ended up increasing all of these trails to a width of eight to 10 feet. Uh, in width. We ended up also going to uh, the forest trails and increasing that width as well with uh, either handwork or smaller machinery out uh, on those trails. And I'm happy to report that our efforts to keep the ranch open have, um, have been good. We've been monitoring all the trails, the usage, and uh, we're noticing that people are really getting used to uh, the loop arrangement on the bluff trail and, uh, and people are also keeping a safe distance on all the other trails. And just, you know, I can't emphasize enough to ask the public uh, to help us keep the, the ranch open uh, for everybody to enjoy. And uh, please uh, make sure that you follow the directions and the signage that we have out there for, for people. Uh, the other topic that uh, has also been discussed is the public restrooms. And uh, as mentioned, we ended up closing the public restrooms on Sheffield and Center Street. Uh, and in their place, we installed one handicap and one regular uh, restroom along with a hand washing station and also a trash container there. And our staff is monitoring the, the use of that to see what what if, what if people are using it, how much they're using it, uh, and and see if we need to make any uh, arrangements for that. Uh, the other area that we wanted to focus as a department was to help the homeless community out. Uh, specifically, there's an area on between Cambria Drive and the corner of Cambria Drive and Highway 1. And there is a large number of encampments in this area. And one of the things that I wanted to try to provide for the homeless community there was a restroom uh, some type of uh, hand washing station and some type of uh, trash service there. So uh, I ended up reaching out to Harvey's Honey Huts and asking them to drop off a uh, restroom and a hand washing station. We ended up taking a dumpster that was unused at the Veterans Hall and moved it over uh, to an area and asked for uh, Mission Country Disposal to provide weekly services to that area. In order to accommodate that, you can see on the uh, map there uh, that we ended up mowing a section on the Fiscalini Ranch to be able to provide these, uh, these services for the homeless community. Now, the homeless are actually not on CCSD or Fiscalini Ranch property. They're actually on, on the Caltrans right away. 
but we wanted to make sure that they were able to use these services. And so we provided them as close as possible to their location. And I spoke to the Fiscalini our Ranch Board and their Executive Director about uh, me uh, utilizing that area, the Fiscalini Ranch, to provide those services, and they were they were on board with that. I also uh, reached out to the commander, the sheriff commander, and advised them of what we were doing, uh, so that he could uh, possibly go out there and um, uh, or just be aware of the possible increase in homeless activity that. Uh, might occur because of the services we're offering there. As mentioned last time, also we had uh, quite a few uh, trees that we needed to deal with on the fiscal union ranch specifically. We had about 12 uh, dead trees on Victoria Way um, on the ranch side that were a hazard to the public and we ended up uh, partnering with one of the contractors here in town to be able to get those taken care of before uh, the storms this weekend. We had a number of trees also on Warren Drive uh, that we were dealing with, uh, some fairly large. And these two were also um, taken care of before uh, the storm hit. Um, I did reach out to the California Conservation Corps because they had a group that offered or was trying to look for some work uh, in the county. Uh, as far as dead trees and stuff like that. I reached out to them, but uh, what they mostly open forest work and that uh, they don't have any climbers that can go up and actually uh, bring these trees down in, in sections, which is what we really needed uh, in this instance. But uh, we'll definitely keep them um, uh, in our, in our, uh, uh, in our efforts for future, future work on the ranch. And, um, Happy also to mention that the trees that we took down, we were able to take the uh, the wood chips over to uh, the dog park to replenish the uh, the wood chips there. Uh, that's my report. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I don't see any hands being raised. Let me make President a Farmer. Oh yes, Director Rice, go right ahead. Sorry, you can just assume I'm going to have a question. Sorry. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for, for a good report, and I appreciate you working on behalf of the homeless to get some extra um, sanitary services over there for them. I do very much appreciate that. Um, I, I know when a tree is dead, the county doesn't require replacement. I don't know what kind of trees they were, so I'm just curious if we do any replacing and um, just two quick other questions, and then I'll and then I'll sign off so you can answer. Um, one is maybe we make a note now that face masks are recommended on those signs you put up. I don't know. I haven't been out there, so I don't know how complicated that would be to do. And then the other question I had is: is the dog park seems like it could be? It, it, it's a good resource for people to exercise, but it, it concerns me because of the gates and all the touching. And I, we kind of um, raised the question at the last time we had a meeting. And so I was just curious if we had any further thoughts on that. Thank you. Those are uh, very good questions. Uh, so as far as the, the tree replacement, uh, so we have a permit uh, that is two, actually two permits uh, for tree work on the ranch. Uh, we we do replace trees. In fact, uh, this uh, winter we planted over 500 trees on the fiscal in the ranch, uh, and we have had several work parties to water those trees in the uh, in the drought that we had. So we're replenishing pine trees uh, throughout the ranch. It's more of not just planting uh, everywhere, but having specific areas where we're planting and not causing more overcrowding of the trees. Uh, so there, Thank you. there is an ongoing there is an ongoing and yearly uh, planting program there. Uh, as far as the face mask on the ranch and signage, uh, we can certainly look into that and see how we can incorporate that into the signs that we have out there right now. As far as the dog park, I reached out to the county uh, shortly after our last uh, uh, special meeting, and the county informed me that uh, dog parks are not on the list of closures yet. We have been monitoring the dog park and how much usage it's had. And um, it hasn't really changed. Uh, 
as far as the typical usage that we had before uh, before we had this uh, epidemic. Um, and so one of the things that we've done is we've mainly spread out all of the seating across the park so that there's enough spacing between all the, the people using the park there. Uh, on average, we're probably seeing anywhere between four and six people using the park at a time um, uh, and not much more than that. Director Rice, did you have any Thank other? Thank you. No, no, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just, I worry sometimes about those gates and making sure people are being careful when they do go to use it because of those touching spots. As, as, as Ms. Duffield said to me the other day when I came in to sign something I had to actually sign in person, you'd be amazed at the number of things that you touch that you don't even think about the fact that you're touching. Well, th thank you for that reminder, Ms. Rice. And I'll just be, we'll all be more conscious of what we're touching. I just wanna make a comment with regard to what you were saying, Carlos. Um, last Thursday, I went over to the um, Catholic Church. Uh, the food bank has their monthly uh, food distribution there. And so I just wanted to talk with people in line and uh, see what their needs were you know, mainly with regard to their availability to pay rent and their utility bills. And I happened to uh, talk with one person who was living in that right of way area there, uh, adjacent to the ranch, one of the homeless people who's been living there for about a year, she said. And uh, she relayed to me that uh, those homeless people, I think she said there were like nine encampments. And she relayed that um, the folks there were very much appreciative of us setting up uh, the porta potty and the hand washing station. So I thought I'd pass that on to you. And of course, to the rest of the board and staff. Yeah, thank you, Harry. I appreciate it. Yeah, I've talked to the homeless uh, folks there uh, over the last couple of weeks or so since we installed it. And uh, they've been taking, taking advantage of the trash dumpster there, putting their trash in there. So I'm happy, happy it's, it's uh, working out for them. Yes, that lady also mentioned that with regard to appreciating the dumpster being there. So anything else, Carlos? That's it for my report. Okay. Oh, I see. You know what? I see Director Hal has his hand back up. So uh, yes, Don, go right ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, just a, a clarification. So the area where the, the homeless folks are presently camped near where you have the dumpster and the uh, hand washing and the porta potty. I, did I hear you correctly to say that those are all encampments on the county right of way? Is that is that correct? So all of those encampments are actually on Caltrans right of way. Caltrans. I'm sorry, Caltrans right of way. Okay, so this is not an issue where CCSD needs to get involved in any way regarding any kind of evictions or anything. It's it's really Caltrans' responsibility <coughs> should they choose to take it. That's. Would I be correct in that, Tim, um, Council? Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, and while I'm while I've got the floor, one last question, just as a more general one. Uh, this is more for Council. Um, because of the moratorium on evictions uh, statewide. Does this mean that uh, where someone may be establishing a tenancy by trespassing, um, does this mean that we really have to hold off any kind of action? Uh, this may not be the appropriate forum to answer that, but you can see that I do have some, there's maybe some issues there. Uh, so I, I'd just like to hear a little bit. Yeah, the, the courts aren't, aren't, aren't actually hearing unlawful detainers at this time, so there's no venue. Um, in which to evict someone, at least for the time being. And I think that's going to be the case for another month or two. Yeah, and just to, just to piggyback on that comment from Tim. So our, our, our general uh, procedure right now during this time is that we're not evicting anybody uh, on CCSD properties or Fiscalina Ranch, uh, both to limit the interaction of us with the homeless uh, folks out there, uh, but also understanding that it's not really a time to be evicting folks from from their places uh, we're merely documenting where they're at and then 
uh, checking in on them every so often, and then we'll we'll go from there once the uh, once the situation passes. President Farmer, I have a follow up for that. Yes, Director Rice. Um, are we are we doing anything to try to connect them with county services? I know the county is trying to house people, especially if or when they get sick, but but possibly before that time, are we connecting them or giving them the information so they could, if they need to take advantage of those services, either because they're sick or they want to try and get out of the elements? So as far as me, I haven't been uh, reaching out to them as, as far as that, but I certainly need to look into the services and, and, and provide them with uh, some document that uh, they can use. Um, you know, again, we I'm looking at how many we have on the ranch and it's very limited, if any, at this point. Most of them have moved out to that area where we're, we've provided those services. Um, uh, but again, I'll, I'll look into how we can reach out to them a little more. It could just be posting a phone number and something on the on the dumpster that we've we've put in a more convenient location for them. I just I just don't know. Uh, I don't know what other people are going out trying to help them out to let them know that the county wants to help that the state wants the county to help, you know. Yeah, that's a good idea about posting it on the dumpster. We'll I'll make sure I look into that. Thank you. You know, Carlos, one more comment uh, with regard to the homeless. It just dawned on me. So um, I recently spoke with uh, some of the homeless folks that that I know on a first name basis because that's what I, you know that's kind of who I am. And uh, so I spoke with the folks in the East Village, and they were appreciative of the fact that we also put up a, you know, a, a honey hut and a hand washing station for them in that area as well. So I thought I'd pass that on to you. Great, thank you, Harry. So, Carlos, any anything more to uh, to uh, contribute, or uh, I think you said you were pretty much done with your report, right? Yes, I'm I'm all done unless you have further questions. All right. Well, seeing none, we'll move on to the uh, utilities department manager report. And uh, Ray Dianzo, how are you, Ray? How are the family doing? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you, President Farmer. No, everyone's fine. Um, glad to uh, that most of us are healthy and well. Um, all our staff are, are all healthy and well too. Most of us at least, I should say. Um, so the theme of that, that, that I want to continue with this is something we're also following here in the utilities department is we're, we're, we're continuing to practice the, the social distancing or the term I like to say is physical distancing. Um, some of the things that, that have already been said, avoiding contact with the public, suspending group meetings. <clears throat> unit, we, we, we do have unit specific meetings, but we, we maintain a, a social distancing uh, with that. Our wastewater, treatment, our wastewater treatment plant is on lockdown, uh, meaning that only authorized personnel is allowed in the plant. Um, and, and, and even if they are allowed in the plant, like for example, the people that pick up our our water samples, they, they, they have uh, uh, for, uh, personal protective equipment on and also maintain social distancing. Also, I also wanted to, to say that we're focusing our, our operations on essential facilities and, and essential functions. I, I do want to reiterate, you know, the obvious essential functions are the functioning of the water and the wastewater uh, infrastructure. But things like water quality monitoring is also an essential function. So those are all uh, something that we're continuing to do. Um, it's not falling by the wayside. We're continuing to uh, collect samples and those labs that are involved with testing the samples are also open and uh, they're collecting them. They're all essential um, uh, personnel to maintain the health and safety of, of our community. And we're also focusing on preventative maintenance at this point. Uh, uh, we do have the, you know, everyone uh, healthy and well to be able to do some projects that will focus on uh, preventing emergencies in the future, uh, anticipating um, 
a worst case scenario where not a lot of us are going to be available uh, due to either us being sick or family members being sick that forces us to be quarantined. But uh, we want to be uh, looking forward, be forward uh, thinking as far as uh, being prepared for emergencies and fixing those facilities uh, before they break. And also another thing there, that we're also preparing as far as preparing for emergencies should we have short staff is we're condensing our, our standard operating procedures, uh, meaning that we're, we're condensing it to like a simple one page checklist. So if someone from the outside were to come in and be a substitute operator, they would be able to follow a very simple checklist to get it to keep everything up and running or a simple phone call would be able to clarify something. So that's that. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're maintaining our physical distance from each other here. Uh, uh, part of our uh, standard operating procedures is we do maintain uh, good hy hygiene practices. Uh, most of everyone here are trained to wash their hands and not touch their face and wear um, eye protection and and body protection and, and face shields and things like that whenever it whenever it's needed boots um, and then also some of the guys here if they do get all dirty they do um, have shower facilities that they're able to shower so they're not taking any of those dirty clothes home with them so uh, those are the things and we're also trying to maintain a um, uh, a recommendation of, of trying to maintain a one operator per vehicle. But if, if it's unavoidable, uh, at, at, at this point, there are some that, you know, have to share a truck, but if they do, uh, we're, maintain, we're, we're trying to keep the same people uh, as a group so that they're, main, uh, they're limiting their contact with, with different people. They're just trying to stay with the same, uh, with the same team each time. And we don't, we, we also tell them not to switch drivers. Uh, we might ramp that up a little bit. Uh, we, you know, as with, with the new CDC recommendations of face masks, uh, we might ramp that up as if they're going to be working in uh, close quarters, meaning anything less than six feet, uh, we would uh, require them to wear uh, the face masks. Um, and just to, to be clear on that, the face mask is not to prevent the virus from infecting, but to, to prevent the aerosol spray from people talking. So, you know, we want to keep the, um, the N95 masks for the health professionals, for those who need it. So uh, we'll, we'll try to get some more masks that are not N95, but we'll do the job that we, we hope to do. Um, so those are, my, that's my, uh, my uh, report. Uh, I, I, you know, I wanted to men, you know, make mention that we were continuing to maintain high quality water and wastewater um, operations here. Um, I know people have asked the question about, you know, have toilet wipes or things other than toilet paper starting to clog up our system. We haven't seen that any issue like that. I, um, uh, you know, we are vigilant about it because uh, most of those problems would probably be seen in the lift stations but we haven't seen any issues like that. But yeah, those are, that's my report. So Ray, let me ask you this. Um, you know, that was something that came up at the meeting two weeks ago. And for what it's worth, um, I mentioned in my president's report that I put out on social media about people being conscious of what they throw in the toilet, you know, that it's just for human waste and toilet paper. And um, hopefully in some fashion or an, and had a list of things not to put in the toilet. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that perhaps there's a lesson, has been a lessening of that. So maybe in fact, social media actually was helpful in that regard. I believe so. Yeah, but most of the, the people in, in our community are very, very respect, responsible in that way. So Right, yes. All right. thank you. Um, so Director Rice, uh, do you have any uh, questions or comments for uh, Mr. Bienzo? <laughs> well, you said you'd Hello. have a question for just about everybody. So yeah, I think I, I, no, no, no. I think, I, I think Haley and I were going back and forth as unmuting me and muting me. Um, okay. um, 
I, I, thank you so much for your report, Ray, and for, for taking care of the guys, making sure that they're, and, and I use guys because we haven't hired any women yet, right? And it tends to be male dominated, but, but thank you for all of that. And, and I know that you are also probably keeping in touch with the Regional Water Quality Control Board. I hope they've been a resource for you in working on um, either the checklist or the SOPs if, if they needed to be, but, but um, they're probably jammed up too and busy. But I appreciate your report and, and really that's, I don't really have a question for you other than I hope that, that you're getting support from the agencies that are, that are the resource agencies and who watch the quality of what we're doing over here. Thanks. Thank you, Director Rice. Director Howell. Uh, just a quickie, um, you mentioned masks. Uh, how are your uh, PPE supplies holding up? Well, we, the, we have standard PPEs. We, we, don't, we don't use, we typically don't use the, the N95 style mask because the water will just go right through that. Um, but we do have uh, face shields and we do have goggles and we have coveralls, things like that, boots. But um, we will be getting some some masks here uh, before the before the day is done. So, uh, I, I guess, if I may, um, I guess what I was wondering is whether it's time to ask the community to start making masks for you guys, or or do you think you're going to be all right? I, well, I think that's very thoughtful, but I, I think we'll be okay. Cool. Right. Just out of curiosity, since you just mentioned face shields and goggles. Uh, how often do uh, do staff have to use those? They they only they, they typically would use it whenever there's a spray situation. So anytime they have to hose down, for example, they when they hose down the filters or or have to turn on the aerator um, sprays or spray down the air the, the aerator basins, um, those are the times to where they need to put on the face shield and um, work work. We've changed some things in our process to, to, uh, to maintain any splashing danger, but, um, but we do have uh, anytime there's, there's any kind of spray involved or hose that we have to hose down something, that's when uh, those type of PPEs would be used. All right, thank you. Director Howell, you still have your hand up? Uh, Don, you need to unmute yourself. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Um, yes. Mr. Uh, Danzo is finished. I, it was, I wanted very briefly to say something to uh, Carlos, if I might. So, but I, I just wanted to be sure before we moved on. Uh, is, is, is it appropriate at this moment? Uh, Carlos, I was afraid that my question to you, you might have taken that as something of a criticism. Uh, I'm actually extremely impressed and pleased with the humane way in which you have been dealing with the homeless. And I, I encourage you to continue in that mode because I really think uh, you're doing a fine job and I really appreciate the humane approach that you're taking. And I, I just wanted to be clear about that and make sure that uh, you didn't take anything I said as a criticism of what's going on there. Thanks. Uh, I, I did not, uh, Director Howell. I thank you. I appreciate the, the comment. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on that. It's, uh, it's, it's nice to know that, you know, kindness and thoughtfulness with regard to the less fortunate in our society are being observed at our district. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. All right, uh, seeing that we are finished with the manager updates. So let's move on to um, uh, item number four, which is public comment on agenda items. And so what we're going to do uh, we'll just take public comment on each item of regular Mr. business. Farmer, I think there's one hand up. Oh, pardon me. Uh, you just put that up there. Uh, Vice President Steidel, pardon me. I'm, I'm sorry for catching you just at the end there, President Farmer, but um, I just wanted to take a moment um, to uh, express my appreciation to all of the managers who were giving reports today. They provided very specific information and great information for the community. And um, I certainly hope that the community 
um, feels that there's an um, extraordinary effort that these folks are putting out to maintain the services and the quality of things that we have available to us. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge their, uh, their efforts and thank you so much for your reports today and for the information. Thank you. That point is very well taken, uh, Vice President Steidel. Thank you for that comment. All right, moving on to uh, public comment on agenda items. And as I was saying, what we'll do is uh, we'll move on to regular business and take public co email comments on each item as they come up. Uh, so let's move on to regular business and uh, item number A. And um, let me ask you, Haley, before we move to this item and uh, it being introduced, well, um, let me see, why don't, um, General Manager Weigold, why don't you introduce this item and then we'll see if there are any public comment on this, on item A. Okay. Uh, President Farmer, uh, our first agenda item, uh, number 5A, is discussion regarding operational and fiscal impacts of the coronavirus pandemic and actions and efforts undertaken to address those impacts. Staff is recommending that the board of directors discuss the operational and fiscal impacts of the coronavirus pandemic and actions and efforts that have been taken to address those impacts. Uh, I'll uh, turn it back over to President Farmer to uh, start the discussion. So I, I see uh, District um, Assistant District Clerk uh, Dodson is on the screen here. So do we have any public comment on this item? Any I do that? not have any public comment on this item. All right, thank you. Yep. So uh, General Manager Weigold, uh, and, well, board, do we have any uh, comments and questions on this particular item for our General Manager? Uh, Director Rice? No, nope, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Okay. I think it's too early to really know what the impact may eventually be. I'm glad that we can have a discussion on it whenever we need to. Thank you for having it on the agenda. So General Manager Weigold, are there any further comments that do you feel need to be made at this time on this item? I would say, um, you know, the, the big issue for us is um, continuing operations in our core areas. Um, and right now, uh, while there's nothing to report, um, I can share kind of what I think about uh, when I wake up in the middle of the night, and that is, you know, the health and safety of everyone. So, um, you know, we are we're taking precautions right now in hopes that no one gets sick. But um, obviously part of my job is to, you know, look at various scenarios. So, you know, some of the things I'm thinking about is, well, what happens if, you know, everyone gets sick and it's all at the same time. And so, you know, we actually have uh, scenarios in place for help. Uh, that's from various other organizations in our uh, geographic proximity. Um, we have uh, ways to think about now uh, who can work and when and how. Um, so if you've been exposed but not yet sick, you can still work. Um, but um, you know, we uh, we're, we're thinking about how we quarantine people. We have we have two people in quarantine right now. That doesn't mean that they're sick, but they have been uh, uh, potentially exposed. Um, and so um, we're taking the abundance of caution uh, and leaving those people home because we don't need them right now. And um, if they were to come in and, and then get sick and pose a risk to others, that would be a worst case. So, uh, so I'm leaning forward while I can to take more conservative measures than not. So um, the, uh, the guidance that I'm following is right from the county health department. And um, that, that guidance gets updated, as, as you all know, pretty regularly. And so um, we now have, I have an avenue now where I can take a scenario 
and call the county and talk through not only what I should do, but how I should do it. So, um, you know, they're learning uh, on the fly as we are, but uh, these are the kind of things that I'm, that I'm wrestling with on a daily basis. Um, and as you can imagine, one issue can take hours in, uh, to, to, uh, to address. So uh, there's lots of work that goes into all these. And uh, I just would just share that, uh, you know, these are the kind of things we're doing. Uh, and of course, our fiscal working with the finance manager, uh, we're, we're keeping an eye out on our water use and our fiscal condition as we go along as well. All right, thank you, General Manager Weigold. Um, I don't see any uh, comments or questions from uh, members of the board. So uh, we'll move on to item five. I, President oh. Farmer. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm really, so, I'm really sorry. I, I have trouble with my internet because you know, no job. So, um, which makes this all very hard on all of you. Thank you for your patience. Um, the question I had is, is in addition to the talking with County, which is great. Um, are, are you, are you interfacing at all with GMs at other CSDs or with CSDA or anything? I'm sure you're talking with Mr. Carmel in his office, even if it's at a home right now. <laughs> um, but that, that, that's a question I have. Thank you. Yes, Director Rice. The answer is absolutely yes. And uh, there are organizations I'm touching base with that didn't even know existed prior to this virus. Uh, and some organizations that stood up specifically for the virus. So, um, uh, the fire chief has two or three regular meetings during the day that he participates in. I have one uh, with the County Emergency Operations Center or EOC. Uh, I submit data to them and they publish uh, that data from all the other districts on a daily basis. There's a, an evening situation report that gets published. Um, so we're, we're very, very plugged in to, uh, to everything around the county at different levels uh, across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rice. So um, let's move on to item 5B. And uh, General Manager Weigold, if you would introduce this item, please. Be helpful to unmute myself. I ask President Farmer, agenda item 5B is discussion and consideration of adoption of resolution 10 2020 declaring a continued local emergency in the Cambria Community Services District due to the corona, coronavir, coronavirus pandemic. Staff is recommending that the Board of Directors adopt resolution 10 2020 declaring a continued local emergency in the Cambria Community Services District due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I, you know, when you stated at the second time, you said item 10, 2020. So I know you were still referencing number, uh, item 9, 2020. Item B. Um, no, the new, the new resolution, resolution is 10, 2020, which is a continuation of resolution 9, 2020. Um, no, uh, item 10, 2020 is about uh, water bills. No, it's not. Am I in error? You're in error. So resolution 9, 2020, that's the resolution through which the board declared the local emergency. It requires right. that uh, the emergency declaration be reviewed at every regular and special meeting to determine if the emergency condition continues to exist. Resolution 10, 2020 is that resolution that determines that the emergency continues to exist. Okay. So legal counsel, since I seem to be a little bit confused right now, um, how should we proceed with item B? Um, after, after discussion, uh, we recommend that you adopt the resolution. All right, okay. So th thank you so much, Mr. Carmel. Um, Director Howell, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yes, the original uh, resolution 9-2020 has a sunset, it has a requirement that we, we readdress it. 
uh, does 10 20 20 override that or is 9 20 20 in other words do we need to have a sunset clause or anything in 10 20 20 or do we just rely on 9 20 20 uh, 9 20 20 established the emergency 10 20 20 will continue continue that declaration and at every meeting uh, from here on out until you guys determine that uh, the emergency doesn't exist we'll go through this same process okay uh director rice um i would move that we approve resolution 10 2020 i don't know if what mr carmel suggested is the most efficient way to do it but let's do it the most obvious way so that it's totally clear what we intend to be happening which is that we're declaring a continuing emergency so that's the basis of my motion to pass resolution 10-2020 perfect okay so uh so do we have a second on this yeah, i'll second that thank you so just for clarification um item 10b we're now referencing 10 2020 but item C, which is resolution 10 2020, we are also going to be addressing. Is that correct? Yeah. Actually, item C is resolution 11 2020, and that's the waiver of well, late charge, waiver of late charges for sewer and water service. Okay. Well, all I'm going on is what I printed out on the agenda. Well, I'm going. I'm going through the same thing. Uh, does everyone? Uh, Mine, right. or, or Amanda, do, do you show 10B or a 5B is resolution 10 2020? Yes. Okay, thank you. And 5C is 11 2020. Mine, mine does also, as well as the actual declarations themselves. Well, then my apologies. Apparently, there was an update and I didn't. Uh, and I didn't print that out. I must have printed out the earlier one. So my apologies. The confusion is all mine. Um, so thank you so much. So uh, I believe we have a motion and we had a second as well. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. So um, hey, Director Farmer, did you want to um, ask if, if there's any more comment before the resolution? Hmm. Uh, do we have any uh, further comments from uh, staff? Uh, do we have any uh, public comment on this item, Ms. Dodson? We don't have any public comment on this item. All right, thank you. So once again, my apologies for the confusion. And if we could have a roll call, please. Sure. Director Rice? Yes. Vice President Seidel? Aye. Director Howell? Aye. Director Pearson? Uh, President Farmer. Uh, yes, thank you. So now moving on to item 5C and um, General Manager Weigold, if you would introduce this item, please. Yes, President Farmer, agenda item number 5C is discussion and consideration of resolution 11-2020, suspending the imposition of late payment charges for district water and sewer service and suspending the discontinuation of water and sewer service for non-payment. Uh, staff is recommending that the Board of Directors adopt Resolution 11-2020, suspending the imposition of late payment charges on delinquent water and sewer bills for the January slash February and March slash April billing cycles and suspending the discontinuation of water and sewer service for non-payment through June 30th, 2020. So, uh, Ms. Dodson, do we have any public comment on this item? We do have public comment from Elizabeth Benhausen, and the comment reads, I urge the CCSD Board of Directors to approve the recommendation by staff in 5C to suspend the imposition of late payment charges on delinquent water and sewer bills for the January, February, and March, April billing cycles and the discontinuation of water and sewer service for non-payment through June 30th, 2020. The disease caused by the virus would be, con would be increased if water and sewer services are turned off. The economic crisis caused by the disease means many people are not able to pay for water and sewer services. The district must provide these essential community services 
during this time of crisis. The water production in March was 36.99 acre feet, only one acre foot less than February. So far, the economic crisis has not created a significant drop in water production. The actual effect on revenue will not be known until the end of April. If it parallels the effect on production, it will not be significant. Please keep water and toilets running for everyone. Elizabeth Bettenhausen. Well, thank you, Haley, and thank you, Elizabeth. Or should I say Ms. Bettenhausen? Well, so um, let's uh, open this up for uh, board discussion. Um, Ms. Director Rice. Um, I just had a question why we put it through June 30th um, and also because um, my landlord pays my water bill. I'm not sure when the March, April bill due date is. So, so those are my two questions because I'd rather have us just have the discontinuation of service that the moratorium on discontinuation of service to run through the end of the declared emergency rather than a, a date certain, because we're not sure. But we're saying only the bills through the March, April billing. If we need to do more, then we can do more than that. But as far as turning off for delinquency, I just was curious why that June 30th date was included there. Thank you, that's my question. Uh, I can try to answer that. Oh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Carmel. Uh, just in, in staff discussing this with the general manager and the finance manager, uh, this seemed to be a, a reasonable date. And I would like to note in, in both these sections, both for the, uh, the, uh, the suspension of, of uh, late payment charges for water and sewer service and for the discontinuance of water and sewer service for non-payment, the general manager is authorized to extend those uh, if the local emergency continues to exist. And I think the board should talk about that provision just so that you're all comfortable with it. And we could certainly change the date to a much later date or ch change the date to when the, emergency, the local emergency is terminated by the board. I mean, that, that's what makes sense to me, but I'd like to hear what the rest of the board has to say. Uh, Vice President Steidel. Uh, thank you, President Farmer. Um, I, um, I would, you know, I, I'm assuming that the staff in its conversations maybe had focused on the June date because that's the end of our fiscal year. That's correct. And um, which would make sense to me. It's something that we could uh, reconsider and push out additionally, but uh, we would probably want to understand some of the implications of that or know what the uh, the fiscal impact was. Not that that would prevent us from doing it, but I mean, that's just good information gathering when you're launching into a budget process. So um, if this stayed in place through June, then we would have a benchmark point to the end of the fiscal year and then could continue it in through the next fiscal year with uh, possible considerations of how we handle the budget. So can I, it, President Farmer, if you don't mind, I have a clarifying question for Vice President Steidel. Of course, go um, so, so, so like we're doing this early and we don't really know what the impact is gonna be. We've, we've heard there's like about 40 something people that are on a payment plan already. Um, I, I, I'm just, and I understand the date for purposes of fiscal planning. I, I just don't think that fiscal year planning in our current, who the frick knows what's going to happen next <laughs> and when. It just seems like having it just, I understand the cutoff, but we can, can't we do the cutoff even if we make it through the end of the emergency? Like maybe make it as a, as a point of reference for purposes of trying to figure out where we are, what we're gonna to have to do if we can continue to do it like this or not. I totally agree with that. Well, I, I guess in my saying the things that I did, maybe I wasn't clear in what I was um, suggesting, but um, uh, that doesn't preclude it being extended beyond any point in time. It's just setting a framework and a point of reference that's anchored onto something and 
and the fiscal year and the fiscal year planning seems like a logical way to apply it. So that's that was just my observation. Um, and um, I think that as Mr. Carmel has indicated that GMY Gold has the ability to extend that um, additionally also, and that may be something we want to discuss further. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that clarification. That helps. I'm I'm just I'm just trying to because I don't know like so that so the this is and this is going to show my financial ignorance of the way that some of our bookkeeping is done at the district and in general with these kinds of agencies, which is which is so the March April billing and then the next billing is the is the May June billing. So why wouldn't we do the um, no late fees through the end of the fiscal year and then make the other, I mean, I'm just, just for, I'm not trying to just make the meeting longer. I'm really trying to understand if there's a reason why we would, I mean, I don't expect people are going to be back at work to pay their March, April bill. I'm concerned about that. So, but maybe, maybe I, it's a concern that I, isn't shared by the rest of the board. So, so I mean, I'm okay going either way. I'd prefer it to say through the end of the emergency. That way, the GM doesn't have to be bothered, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis past the March-April bill. Well, and maybe Ms. Duffield is can help address that for us also. But my only other thought is that by having a demarcation like that, if we're having to go and try to reclaim funds from FEMA, that we've got some logical increment of time that relates to our fiscal year that might put us in a good position. But she obviously will have, um, I'm sure, uh, more appropriate things to say. <laughs> well, Ms. Duffield has had her hand raised now for about two or three minutes. So <laughs> we obviously are prepared to uh, um, make comments and ask you questions. So Pam, go right ahead. Thank you. Okay, sure. So just to clarify, it was my request that this be extended from the original date in the staff report of May 31st to June 30th. And I did that because that is the next time that our next billing cycle will become delinquent. So if we're right in the midst of a billing cycle and everything is all these emergency orders are lifted, I didn't want it to be difficult for people right in the midst of that to, and be forced with a shutoff. You know, we don't really want to do that. So it was my request that we extend this through June at this point. Thank you. D Director so, Rice, oh, go right ahead. So what we're, t we're talking about two different things here, correct? I mean, if I'm wrong, one of them is, di is no late fees right now. Correct. For, for bills. And the other right. one is we're not shutting off service if you don't pay. And that second, the first one goes for two billing cycles, the one that has just ended and the next one. And the discontinuance of service is going all, we're going to have a moratorium on the disconnection all the way through the end of June as opposed to the end of May because it's billing cycle related. That's correct. So what happens is there's a three phase late slash sh shutoff cycle. So you can, okay. the first late notice happens on the 31st day after your bill is due. So like for instance, uh, Monday the 13th, the bills will be due. Normally on the 14th, we would be assessing a 10% penalty and we would be sending everyone a late notice. Then 15 days after that, people get a 48 hour notice and that's a $29.50 penalty. And then at the 60 day point, that's when we begin the shutoff process. And to, to shut off, the fee for that is $140. So what our proposal is that none of those three fees exist and we will not be shutting people's water off 
and reassess it as this unfolds and definitely reassess it by the end of June. And the June date is related to, to that, that count you just did with the calendar for the March-April bills? Well, it'll actually be right in the midst. So the end of May will be the March-April bill. We'll be starting that end of May to the beginning of June to do shutoffs. Uh -huh. So the, sorry, the January-February will be like the May date when we would be shutting off. Oh, okay. So March, okay, so. April extends it out like into the beginning of July before we would do a shut off. It's really confusing right now because our timetable has been moved. As of February 1st, okay. time, our timetables moved and our labels on our fees currently really don't match those anymore because we really can't do a 48 hour notice anymore. It's really a seven day notice. So right. it's just things we're still trying to work through with these new, this new legislation. Okay. okay. I still just generally think that we should have declare moratorium on suspensions until the emergency is over, but I'm okay with leaving the language as it is if nobody else wants to go that direction. Senator Manager Weigel. Yes, President Farmer. Um, so part of the reason to go through just one cycle, which would essentially be about 90 days from now, um, we thought it was a good point to reassess where we were with, with the entire virus situation. Um, if the economy is, is the economy picking back up or not? Um, it, 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 where are we? Are people still getting sick on, out of work? Um, and so uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're already um, working on a payment plan with every single person that has an issue. So, um, you know, we would uh, just thought it was a good place three months from now to reassess where we were. Yeah. So, so um, Ms. Duffield, if I could just ask you, uh, earlier, uh, when you made your presentation, I think you said there were 42 people on payment plans. Um, so just out of curiosity, more than anything else, how many of these have been over, let's say, a, a relatively long period of time? How many of these are relatively recent? So generally, we have about six routine payment plans or shutoffs that happen. And it's Generally speaking, it's most of the time the same customers. We get a change here and there. But generally speaking, it's the same group. So we get them on payment plans and we try to avoid additional late charges because that just sinks them further, you know, underwater. So we try to get them on a payment plan knowing that they're going to have an issue before all these late fees and shutoffs have happened. So our norm say is six. Currently, we have 42. So, you know, we basically have 30 customers, give or take. We're, you know, we're still going to be getting them from now until next Monday when payments are due. So I'm assuming we're still going to get some more. So assuming we have 30 new customers, right now our dollar value is like at $50,000. So that is our benchmark right now to know what revenue we won't receive by the 13th of, of April that we might see later in the month or even into May or June. All right, thank you. Um, any, um, I don't see any hands up from board members. Um, Director Pearson, you, you've been relatively silent in the scheme of things. Did you, you uh, wish to make any comments at all? Uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I an unstable uh, internet. So I've been trying to hold. Uh, but I think uh, we can certainly change it May and 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 extend it or or cancel it or whatever we want to do. It's 
David, I am sorry to interrupt you, but you are kind of breaking up. So uh, our, our apologies uh, in that regard. Um, so I, I'm not seeing any uh, further hands up with regard to comments from staff or board members. So um, would someone wish to make a motion to uh, approve this item? I would make the motion that we approve resolution 11 2020. Thank you, Director Rice. Uh, do I see a second? Director Howell? I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dawson, could we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, President Farmer, before we go to the roll call, uh, you wanted to check with uh, public comment one more time before the vote. Well, thank you. Um, so, Ms. Dawson, do we have uh, any further uh, public comment on this item? We do not. We do not. Thank, thank you for that. reminding me, uh, General Manager Weigel. So uh, if we could have a, a roll call vote now, Ms. Dodson. Sure. Director Rice? Yes. Director Howe? Yes. Director Pearson? Aye. Vice President Seidel? Yes. And President Farmer? Aye. So uh, this concludes the items uh, you know, on the agenda. Does anyone... Uh, wish to make anyone from the board or staff wish to make any comments before we adjourn the meeting? Well, um, seeing, uh, hearing nothing but silence, I, I guess that's, uh, we'll conclude the meeting. So if I could just make these uh, remarks, we've had great California weather the last two days. Um, by my gauge here yesterday, Sunday and overnight, we had an inch and a half of rain Today we have this beautiful sunny day here in Cambry and on the Central Coast. And so therefore, I, I just want to say we should, we can count our blessings considering what's going on in so many other parts of the, the country and the world. So I just want to make this comment also, you know, continue to be kind and considerate of one another, to be grateful that we live here on the Central Coast and uh, everyone uh, be safe, be well, and, um, uh, I'm adjourning this meeting. Thank you so much.